Like many other popular franchises, Star Trek has a long history of attempted movies and television shows. Some, like 1976's The Planet of the Titans and Star Trek Phase 2 are widely known, but there are many other failed projects, however, that aren't quite as famous. This is one of them a mid-90s foray into a revolutionary filming format that could have turned our favourite transporter chief into a bona fide movie superstar. Hey there Trekkies, my name is Michael aka The Trek Lad, welcome back to the channel. I hope you're doing well. That's right, we nearly got a Miles O'Brien movie. Oh, to live in an alternate reality. Star Trek IMAX was conceived around the time of what is considered the peak of Trek's pulp culture popularity in the mid to late 90s. Unfortunately, we don't have much to go on as the project never really got off the ground, but what we do know is so insanely awesome, I'm surprised we don't talk about it more. But before we get into this, please take a second to like this video and subscribe to the channel for weekly Star Trek and sci-fi videos and live streams. You can also support the channel and unlock early access to videos and podcasts, access my private Discord community and other exclusive perks by becoming a fan on Patreon. If that sounds like a good deal to you, head on over to patreon.com forward slash treklad to get started today. Right, let's warp into this. But first, what's an IMAX? IMAX is a system of filmmaking that allows for the capture and true presentation of high resolution film. IMAX movies are usually presented in a tool aspect ratio of 191, something IMAX likes to call floor to ceiling, in specialised stadium seated cinemas that allow a greater field of vision. Combined with state of the art sound, the experience is typically far more immersive than that of a traditional cinema experience. IMAX is a lot older than you probably think. Filmmakers have been attempting to enhance the visual experience since the late 20s with the introduction of 70mm film stock allowing for a much larger picture. Most cinemas back then, and still today for those still packing physical stock projectors, only had projectors for 35mm, also known as academy stock, so movies shot on the new size were rarely seen as intended by its makers. The introduction of IMAX projectors and specialised screens in the late 60s was seen as a breakthrough for the technology, but it would be decades before it found mainstream appeal, likely due to filmmakers still preferring traditional filming equipment, and also likely due to IMAX's relative expense and difficulty to use. In the late 90s, the Rolling Stones used IMAX to capture footage from their 1990 Steel Wheels tour, and in 1995, French director Jean-Jacques Arnold became the first filmmaker to use IMAX for a feature. It was around this time that Rick Berman and the Star Trek franchise started to think of ways to utilise this emerging but still very expensive format for a feature of their own. Following the critical and commercial success of First Contact in 1996, confidence was at an all-time high. At the time, First Contact was Trek at its technical best, so obviously Berman and the powers that were wanted to top that with the next movie. In 1997, Star Trek IMAX was announced as the franchise's next feature. Considering the technology at the time, calling this an ambitious plan, would have been an understatement. Star Trek IMAX was intended to be shot with IMAX's brand new state-of-the-art 3D cameras with CGI graphics, a concept that was beyond even Pixar when they made Toy Story a few years prior. Due to the expense of IMAX, the movie was intended to be around 35 to 40 minutes in length at a budget of around 10 to 12 million dollars, which comparatively would have put the project roughly on par with First Contact on a dollars to minute basis. What we would have been treated to on screen sounds like a Trekkie's dream. A script put together by Rick Berman and Hans Tobison, known primarily at the time for his work on Sequest and later Enterprise's rubbish season 2 episode Bound, would have included characters from every series at the time, introduced new characters, and would have been headlined by a returning Cole Meany as fan favourite Miles O'Brien. Despite a completed script, however, the specifics of the story remain unknown, but the inclusion of David Warner returning as Chancellor Gorkon, last seen dead on a table in the 2290s, seemed to indicate some sort of time travel shenanigans. Sounds amazing, right? So what happened? Why didn't we get this movie? 
Like many, many things associated with Star Trek IMAX, the reasons behind the failure of the project remain unknown. In 1999, as part of an interview for Star Trek Magazine's 50th issue, Berman said of the project, The IMAX film seems to be somewhere between on a back burner and dead in the water. We developed and wrote a wonderful script. Paramount loved it, and the IMAX people loved it. It was a story that would have mainly featured Cole Meany's character and a bunch of new characters in the 30 to 45 minute movie. For business reasons, in terms of the dealings that went on between Paramount and IMAX, it's on the back burner. As to whether it will move on to a middle burner or a front burner sometime in the near future, that's anyone's guess. Ultimately, Star Trek IMAX never entered production, and the franchise moved on, releasing Insurrection in 1998 and Nemesis in 2002, before Berman's tenure ended in 2005. Knowing what little I know about IMAX, I think the movie failed because of the technology. Back then, shooting a movie in IMAX was incredibly difficult. I mean... Even now, it's still something that most people don't do. Christopher Nolan, IMAX's biggest fan, is still known to only shoot about a third of his movies using IMAX. Pixar's attempts to release Toy Story in the format back in 1995 failed because its visual rendering couldn't actually match IMAX's image size, so knowing that Star Trek being a, a heavily effects-driven feature, I'm assuming that Trek's team of visual experts would have probably encountered the same issues. Star Trek would eventually hit the big, 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 big screen 19 years later with the two-week IMAX release of J.J. Abrams' 2009 movie, which helped add just over $8 million to the already franchised best box office returns. As for our dear old Miles, Cole Meany never quite levelled up to leading man status on the big screen, but after completing his tenure on Deep Space Nine at the turn of the millennium, he would go on to provide memorable performances in movies such as Layer Cake, Law Abiding Citizen, and my personal favourite Meany movie, Get him to the Greek. My wife has got Vedicus veins! <laughs> and that's the story of Star Trek IMAX. What would you have liked to have seen from the movie had it seen the light of day? Do you think we'll ever see a Star Trek IMAX movie? Let me know in the comments. And don't forget to like this video and subscribe to the channel for more videos like this coming soon. Until the next one, stay happy, stay safe, and live long and prosper.